Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. Off we go, and welcome to another version of the Wired to Lead podcast. Your host, Perry Smith. And Cameron Gott, we are jumping right in. We are joined today by a wonderful individual, um, Kiko Matthews, uh, who is calling in from, or actually has uh, joined us today from uh, Wimbledon, uh, right outside of London. Um, Kiko has taken the uh, CPP. We talk a lot about leadership, uh, cognitive preferences. Um, just as a reminder, if you're first joining us here at the Wired to Lead podcast, we have a wonderful assessment um, on our website, and it is the website is uh, www.avalonleadership.com. Um, we have uh, the assessment available to anyone you join Avalon. You can certainly take the assessment, find out how you're wired to lead. Um, and the assessment essentially identifies these hardwired traits in your brain. Um, it's, it's cognitive activities that your brain does efficiently versus some activities that your brain may do somewhat less, in a, or less efficiently. Um, although you could do those, those activities well. Um, what we talk about here is, is we, we have discussions with, with uh, partners and uh, very interesting individuals who have tapped into these cognitive assets, and we understand how those assets serve them. Uh, we also understand how uh, blind spots may crop up. Um, and, and essentially, the survey, what it indicates is, uh, breaks it down within the following categories. It talks about associative thinking, which is not connecting, uh, essentially wired for context or the why, or sequential thinking, which is more of what we call slow thinking, um, or understanding the impact, uh, sequencing of events, uh, and process. And then there are the other domains as well. It's uh, the immortal domains we talk about, which are your mover, what type of mover are you? A fast mover? Are you a little bit less of, a, um, of an active mover? Your observer, your reader, your talker, and your listener. So with that lead in, I do want to turn it over to Cam for him to say a few words here before we begin. And then we are going to jump right into the conversation with Kiko, who has been waiting very patiently. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about her story. Thanks, Perry. And also, we're joined by uh, another Avalon team member, Erin Mattias. And Erin's uh, a part of Avalon. She's also a part of a, a leadership initiative at Lehigh University. So, Erin, thanks for joining us today, too. Yeah, happy to be here. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Erin. Sorry to leave you out of that intro. <laughs> I thought it was on a roll and I left you out. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's your, uh, Perry, that's your high observer, man. She, we just, we're not seeing her, right? So. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation with Kiko. Um, I, I, I was giving some thought to this and uh, it's just uh, amazing what she's going to be doing uh, in, in the middle of the winter here uh, uh, to row from the Canary Islands uh, across and uh, try to break the women's record. Is that right, Kiko? That's correct, yes. Um, I'm very lucky because there's only five other women who ever across the Atlantic, so I'm not up against a, a huge, great sort of array of numbers. Um, but yeah, I am trying to beat the French solo female record um, of the 3,000 miles from Gran Canaria to Barbados, which was set in 2002 of 56 days. I'm going for 45 days. Yeah, 45. So um, this took me back to camp. When I was 11, I went to a camp in Maine. So Maine is one of our states there in the up near... Uh, Nova Scotia, and we had a small little lake, and we had a, a competition where uh, there was rowing. There was a rowing competition across the lake, and so I set my eyes on on winning the competition, and I, I was the champion rower for for one year. We just rowed a basically a, an aluminum rowboat across the lake. It was like uh, maybe three. It may have been it, to my eleven year old eyes, it may have been like you know a big crossing. But it was probably like 
uh, you know, 600 yards or 600 meters. So, so the first question is, is, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of um, gaps to row, uh, right? Starting with the English Channel and the North Sea and the Mediterranean and all these gaps. And I guess I'm curious about uh, the Atlantic, right? That's a, that's, that's no small goal. <laughs> and just like, what, what is that? And we want to tap into your, your leadership and how you see the world and your unique wiring. But I want to start there is the, how did it come about that you're just like, okay, it's going to be the Atlantic and it's going to be this record. And, and now, and now it's, and you're really only a couple weeks away from doing this. So where did it start and how did this formulate in your, in your mind, Kiko? So um, I think you're right. There are lots of gaps. They're much easier. And people will say to me, oh, like, so when are you rowing the channel? I'm like, yeah, if only it was the channel. Um, <laughs> so yes, that would have been a very sensible, it would have been over and done within about a day. So that would have made it a bit boring, maybe. I'm not sure. But essentially, I know, <laughs> I know the guy whose boat I'm using. And I've been watching, and there's also quite a big race that goes on across the Atlantic. And so I had been following those, and I've been following, I followed him, I was friends with him. So I guess it was all I kind of, was focused, all I really knew or knew of was the Atlantic crossing. Obviously there are Pacific crossings, which are much bigger and much scarier and there's Indian crossings, but the Atlantic, I guess, was closer to home than any of the others. And it was just what I, I knew. I didn't know any, I didn't really think about anything different. It was just a, oh, well, I rode the Atlantic. There's a record to be broken. Let's just do it. That was about literally about as far as it went in terms of like which ocean I would go for and why I would do it. I suppose. Yeah. Can you give us a little backstory on the, the, the reason why and bring in the, the, the money you're raising and the, the, uh, the cause? Yeah. Exactly. So it, um, just in my, it, just throughout life, I've always been one who likes to have a big challenge to focus on. I think challenge is really important. And um, in 2009, I'd nearly died of a pituitary tumor, the disease called Cushing's. So it's not cancer, but it's a, uh, disease that causes a tumor to produce excessive um, cortisol. Well, ultimately excessive cortisol, there's a messenger hormone, which we don't have to go into the science of it. Um, and put me to the point where I was in intensive care at King's College Hospital, which is an incredible hospital in London. Uh, they were amazing, the team, and they took it out. And within a week, I think I was leaving hospital and life continues. I mean, to the point where my body, I couldn't get up the stairs or out of a bath on my own because my muscles were wasted. I was an end-stage diabetic. I hadn't slept for two or three months. Um, I've got memory loss, psychotic. I've got uh, so many different, <laughs> ridiculous the amount of um, uh, symptoms I had. But as soon as they took it out, because the tumour was causing the hormones to be released, they took the tumour out, the hormones disappeared, the symptoms went, and about two years later, my body was essentially back to being normal. So I wanted to thank King's College Hospital for saving my life by ironically probably doing one of the most dangerous things out there. But um, So, so a, th a thank you note wouldn't do here. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> well, I think also when I finished that, I just realized like how lucky I was. I mean, it made me realize how lucky I had been before I was ill, but also the fact that I was lucky still to be alive. And I've, ever since then, I just wanted to make a difference and help other people so work on myself as well but just make sure that the number one thing in life is that I am I've got purpose basically is what I want to do and and this is part of the purpose that my challenge is yes it's partly for me to, to grow me but also it's important for me to grow that it has got purpose if that makes sense I feel yeah. I grow more if what I do has got purpose behind it so, yeah. Which which sounds a lot like uh, many of the active associatives that we've talked with, right? Is that uh, leaders who are active associative and and in your CPP score, you're uh, almost a ninety associative or eighty nine associative, uh, eleven sequential, meaning you're preferent to the associative processor more so than the sequential. Uh, you're wired more for context, for experience, and that compelling why. Is a, is a big um, tether or anchor point that uh, serves associative leaders quite well. Um, Perry and I were talking with an individual last week, uh, Pete York, 
about um, he's involved with social impact and evaluation. And much like you, again, that the cause, uh, the purpose was really center. It was a center driver in, yeah. in everything that he did. And he talked about a path, right? His path. And that you're very much in touch with your path. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Like I, I mean, I, I almost feel like I'm somewhat at the end of my path in a good way. And, and now I'm kind of, I'm trying to get other people on their paths is what I'd like. You know, I, I want to, I feel so happy and content with where I am. And that, like I say, is actually the purpose on that path. Um, yeah, to the point now where I'm almost like hmm, pretty happy with where I am. And this is why I'm doing things for other people, I suppose. I, and I feel you get more energy as well. I feel you I personally feel a lot more energized when I'm doing things that I want to, that have got a purpose, that have got like, yeah, like what we're just talking about. So to me, it's, it's a double whammy of greatness. Double whammy of greatness. I love <laughs> very, that. Very good at English. <laughs> <laughs> that's great the um can i ask you a question here real quick so so ahead, Perry. so you're I explain a little bit also about if you will you know once you made your decision you said you're going to go ahead and do this what what was the ramp up with as you were your body was healing to to then make the shift into the training you know eventually to to align with this goal i mean because i, I i've watched a bunch of your videos and i that that's you know as a former athlete as well um I played football in college and, you know, so training cycles are very, uh, very, you know, close to my heart. And I feel like, you know, if I'm, I'm at my best, if I'm training for something, there needs to be the goal. But um, just for anybody, you know, listening or, or watching today, I mean, I, I went through a list of the training that you, that you've been doing just to get ready for this. And that's uh, stationary rowing, um, regular rowing. And I guess in, in skulls or, uh, you know, or, or, uh, you know, longer boats, you've, been, you've done military boot camp, you've done standing paddleboard, resistance training, anaerobic, aerobic, what, I mean, it everything, right? Uh, I mean, you're working, you're working with some of the members of, of the Royal Military, right? Royal. Um, so we, yeah, we have something over here called BMF, which is the, the, the ex, are they ex-military or they're associated with the military? They do like park fitness. So you all get together and the idea is that you, do exercise in a community out in the park, so in the fresh air, and you're kind of boot camped into keeping going. It's very, it's it's a, a nice version of um, military pain, I imagine. I, I think. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I was born. I, I loved sport as a kid, but I was never. I've never been one to go to the gym. I've never been very. I've never had a sort of mega focus. I'm not. I'm not. I can't do timetables and you tell me and I'm good at sticking to timetables. I had to be all over the place a little bit in order for me to work. I like change. I like it, which is very interesting. So I'm going to be stuck in a boat <laughs> doing something very different. Right. Yeah. Um, so all my training, I really feel that it's stuff I love. So I love cycling um, and I will cycle to get to a meeting. There's the purpose in it. So I don't just go around the block 10 times because I've got to do it. I'll do it because I've got to get from A to B and like the same with my paddleboarding as my business. So that's really great. Um, I love the people at the gym. So I go there as part as like my evening, instead of watching telly, I go and talk, <laughs> interestingly talk far too much, but get told to focus and, and do my gym stuff. And I also, you know, I'm driven by, I've got an end goal. So my end goal is to make all the people that are part of this proud of me. And I've told everyone I'm going to do it. So that's what I, when I'm sitting on my <laughs> indoor rower, which I absolutely hate because it has no purpose. That is what I'm thinking about when I wanted to stop and jump off. I'm like, come on, Kiko, you've got to keep going. You, you... It's not about me anymore. It's about the, the ladies who have invested in their, their, their money in me to help this happen is, is what it's about now. So that's what is driving me to carry on um, training, I suppose. It's so funny. Um, this is Aaron jumping in here. Um, when both Perry and you were just talking about the never been able to kind of go to the gym and just do the same routine, I feel very much the same way um, and like to mix up the different kind of workout styles. Um, but yet I was a, a competitive runner in college and so and a long distance runner. So you kind of get into this kind of grinding mentality. But I loved cross country much more than I liked track because um, you're just running in a circle or the idea of being on a treadmill for me is so incredibly limiting. So I, I hear that indoor rower <laughs> piece, but so what are some of, I know that for me though, to stay engaged over some of those longer distances, 
Um, there was kind of the ultimate purpose like you're talking about. Um, but what are, I'm interested as to what are some of the, the tricks that you use to keep um, yourself engaged in training. Um, so I had like a whole almost bag of tricks, I would call it, that I could pull out to dissociate my thought or that I would lean into or I would count or, you know, so what are some of the tricks that when you're doing some of these longer um, mm longer training periods or training workouts um, and looking forward to, you know, this long trip, right? Um, yeah. There's something about being able to move forward and there's something about having the anchor of your purpose, but what are some of those mental tricks that, that you kind of use um, in your training? I mean, I'm a big, big believer in the power of community and the power of other people to help support you. So I will tell someone, I'll be like, oh, I'm going to do an hour. You've got to, you've got to like, you've got to come back to me and, and and check that I've done it and then if I haven't done it I'll feel so guilty so it's literally the fact that <laughs> I feel like I've not failed because I don't believe in failure but I feel like I haven't fulfilled my goal that little goal to do because I've told someone I'm going to do it and then if I haven't really got a justified a justifiable excuse then I feel guilty so that's a I think it's a very good one to um it's a little bit like what happened when I told the world I was gonna <laughs> row the Atlantic well the minute I'd done it I was like okay, well, I've told everyone I'm going to do it now. I've got no idea if I can, but I've told everyone. So ultimately I have to do it. Um, then I guess when I'm on the row, as a very good example. It's like, I constantly say, come on, Kiko, you're not like, this is just boredom. You've got an ocean to row. And even though you're, and it's funny because if you do it for 2000 meters or if you do it for three hours, mm -hmm. it, the, the feeling happens at the same place. It's not like, oh, 2000 meters is easy. Um, <laughs> doing 2000 you you feel pain on a 2000 at about three quarters of the way through and it's that bit how do you keep the next bit going you don't have a choice when you're in the atlantic so i'm like okay this is i'm gonna get, I'm gonna get this feeling that's all it is it's a feeling come on keep going it's gonna be over and done with and you know i sometimes i close my eyes for a little bit and then i have my head wanders around and i'm observing stuff and looking around and seeing what and trying to do maths in my head and by the time I've tried to do the maths in my head, I'm already, there's another 500 meters gone. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> lots of, you know, there's the kind of the pre tricks and then there's the during tricks. Um, mm -hmm. I guess some people will call it just motivation and drive. Um, mm -hmm. Difficult because yeah, I really hate the rower. Okay. <laughs> Kiko, let me, let me, Aaron, if I can tag onto that, I think, you know, Cam, you talk about curious accountability and, and how, you know, high associates, you know, there, there's a curiosity there, but I, I'm kind of thinking of a different term, which might be, um, you know, uh, creative accountability, which is to pull it outside of you and, and commit to something on, you know, on the outside or to some other people who can then, mm -hmm. you know, in your own mind, you hold yourself accountable. If, if there's, yeah. that's the higher purpose or just stating it and saying, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Well, then, then I, I totally understand that because that motivates you to, to say, I'm not going to let these people down. And if you have people yeah. supporting you, you feed off of that. Yeah, that exactly. Sense? Yeah, I like, totally. I like that term, Perry, creative accountability. And I think that when the, the during tricks that you were talking about, Kiko, um, that is kind of the creative, it's like creative accountability to yourself. So you're recognizing that you might be, um, you're mentally, you have that block or you have that moment. And then at that moment, you know, how do you, how do you rebound? How do you push lean in? Um, and so when you were saying you start looking around or you try to find something to anchor on, uh, definitely something that resonates with me. And then the doing the math in your head, I used to do that all the time, um, when I was competing. So it's finding something to occupy, um, yeah. your brain because it does bounce around a lot like that associative nature it's trying to find something to anchor it to um, yeah. for a moment is kind of how I was thinking about it but yeah so those are the tricks that I'm always most interested to see what other people do because I know that my, I always feel like my brain is all over the place too so yeah I'm um, interestingly I don't listen to music and lots of people are always like oh I train to music and it's just great and it might be better I don't know I've never tried it but I I do everything in life without music without tv without again without reading so I'm very much like I don't have I don't have that distraction um so I have mm -hmm. to use my I train my brain to distract <laughs> to distract me rather than something else mm -hmm. that's interesting well, so I've got a like, I've got a couple things that, that are getting my attention here and um Perry I really appreciate the 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 term creative accountability and um, this um, 
It, it seems like to me, Kiko, it's this uh, sense of responsibility to your supporters. You use, you use the word guilt, but to, to me, it sounds more like there's a great sense of responsibility to when you make a commitment, that commitment means something. And it's something about, um, again, the hospital and what you've committed to them and the women who are supporting you. Um, and can you speak to that? Of because because I don't you know I think that might be some insight here around uh, your own uh, resiliency, your own way that you move forward in the world um, that you have a unique perspective on is this sense of responsibility, this sense of commitment, and and I just what that means to you. You can give some language to that for yeah, us I and our listeners. Um, so yeah, I, I am very much, if I, I can't stand it when people l let other people down and there's not, not a, a really good valid reason. And, and I do, if I'm going to do something, I very much believe that I will do it. And if I can't do it, then I probably won't say yes in the first place. Um, so these women who I just, I just realized that when I was alone at sea, I was going to need something to, to support me and to keep me going. I needed I needed that purpose that I was talking about. And yes, there's getting to Barbados as a purpose. And yes, getting the world record is a purpose, but that's not an emotional purpose. That's like a physical purpose. Um, so obviously raising money for King's College Hospital is a purpose, but uh, that would a lot of that would have happened before I'd set out. So what was going to keep me going? And it was people, it's that responsibility, like you call it that responsibility. So I actually chose for my whole funding to be done by individuals or groups of women um, and their photos are going to be inside my boat uh, which is amazing so when I'm feeling down I look at that and I've got you know whether it's the 10 year old girl that I babysit for who just thinks I'm the most amazing thing ever and that's what she thinks now she thinks that's normal <laughs> that, that women just go out and row the Atlantic and hopefully she'll be something Perfect. like that as well or whether it's like high net worth women who are amazing in the boardroom but there's absolutely no way they'd ever step foot and do what I do and they admire that and they think that it's incredible and they want to see me you know do that and achieve that so or it's a group of girls at a school or you know I've got a whole wealth of different people who are involved and you know looking at those I know that which I know that I keep going because of them and that helps me be more resilient so I've got this whole um, I call it Kikonomics. <laughs> it's a bit of a joke, but it's like how you become resilient and you, you have resources and you have energy. And for my Atlantic row, the resources, my main resources, obviously my boat is very useful in this case. Um, some of my knowledge and some of my skills are very useful resources. But my biggest resource is going to be the contacts and the people and the emotional connection I have that's going to help me keep going. And then the energy is another whole matter of things about not worrying about not trying to you can't control the weather so you just got to like relax and let it be and not sort of stress about things which are going wrong and then you can use that energy for physical rowing um and it works throughout life and it's this is how we one can become resilient um but yes the community the the feeling that connection to other people i think is it definitely drives definitely drives me forward um it keeps me going is you've got like you see, you've got accountability you've got to you've got to turn up on time haven't you you've told everyone you're going to be there so you've got to be there why wouldn't you well, hey kiko let me ask you this do you do you have a like is there a kind of a sat phone check-in thing where you might be able to, to get you know some folks you know part of the way through the journey where you could be checking with them directly or or do you have your coaches or how, how is that working so i've got a sat phone yet yeah. i've got what i don't know 350 minutes or something which is i can't remember what the it's like 2.4 kilobytes a minute or something I don't know um, but I will get an email from my weather router every day mm -hmm. I then obviously when if something goes wrong and I need to help on how to fix my body or how to fix the boat then I've got someone for each of those if I need someone to fix my mind I think I've got some people there probably won't be my mum <laughs> my mum <laughs> bless her will just be watching me as a little dot as I cross the Atlantic uh, she's probably not the best person to be phoning when I cross the Atlantic so I think that's important that you know that you've got, <laughs> got the right people to be um, calling on at the right time uh, yeah mum, mum can wait till the end is there a is there a place we can is there a, a place where we can watch you as a dot and and follow uh, yeah. you as you progress? It will be on my website, which is kikamatthews.co.uk. Um, I think also you will be able to see me on it's an app 
called the Yellow Brick. And there's a race, the race that's going on at the moment, you can watch, it's very exciting, the Talisca Whiskey Race. And you just see it as a boat going, it tells you how fast you've, tells people how fast you've been going and how far you've gone and you can really get into it and it you can overlay it with the weather so you can see what's coming and what they've got at the time so you can be like oh she's so, like great this is gonna be a great week or oh my god look at that massive great big storm that's coming poor thing um oh so yeah the yellow <laughs> yellow brick and looks like <laughs> did you say ye- yellow brick yeah yellow brick wonderful yeah yellow brick tracker well Cam, I tell you what I'm going to do for anyone watching. I'm going to try and share the screen, and I'm going to show you this map here real quick. As I understand it, um, you, you know, you're going from the Canary Islands, which are this, the three islands right here, uh, yeah. three dots, off the coast of Africa, the north north uh, west coast of Africa, yes, northwest coast of Africa, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're going over to Barbados, which is, this, I believe, that is right here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, all right, so this is a technical question. The reason I also brought this up, so... So now, of course, my mind is working and I'm going, okay, well, let me do some math on this. So if you look at this column to the right, Aaron, I wish you could see this. These are the trade winds and the wind speed. So what you're doing, and I, I, I need you to explain this if you can, Kiko, is that, is that the reason you're going in January, and I think you told me that you want to leave on the full moon of January 31st, and let me just spit it out now. So trade winds working in your favor along this kind of wider line here, maybe. So you're going to have wind assistance of, say, like between four and eight miles an hour, right? I think. So that's, that's what the wind, that's the wind pattern it says, the wind speed. Yeah, that's meters per second. So that's pretty fast. So that's yep. 20, that's right, 15, meters, knots, 15, 15 knots is about 20 miles an hour. It's about okay. eight, nine, 19 miles an hour. All right, well, ch- check me on this math. So, so... Robos, large robos is what I looked up. And I, I want to hear, I'm going to see how your brain processes this and everything about yeah. what you've been thinking about. Three to four knots on a steady row. That's about 3.5 to 4.6 miles per hour for American listeners. All right, now if, if I did the math right on it, you're going to be rowing anywhere between 12 to 14 hours a day. Is correct. That, is that right? It is that's, correct, yeah. Okay, that's straight rowing. And mm-hmm. So you're, you've, you've prepared for that. And can it just explain, when I, when I think of that big chunk and I go, I go oh my gosh, I go 12 to, 12 to 14 hours a day of straight rowing. I mean, how have you broken that down in your mind? I mean, how, how are you thinking about that? Because that's, that's over half a day of rowing. And then- I know, it's interesting, because actually what you've got to remember is that a day is 24 hours, whereas yeah. for us a day is 12 or 16 hours. And you're thinking, God, you've got to do 12 hours in your day. Well, actually, that's broken up into 24 hour slot because you row just as much at night as you do in the day. So that kind of helps things. Okay. And I think if you look at that big, like just two things, I was looking at the Atlantic thing. I've got to get from there to there. That's a long way across. But if you just then, if you just do it literally like day by day. And so my, my, t- my aim to get the 45 days is 66.666 miles. I think it's something like 57. I can't remember how many knots it is. Uh, 50, nautical miles 57 i think maybe um so that will be my like daily aim that's all i that's all i've got to think about is that aim to get that amount of knots um nautical miles on a day and then within the day how do i break that down i don't know there's so many different people said so but if you're in a two man or a four man or whatever you can just do two hours on two hours off two hours on two hours off and the boat just keeps going obviously if you're a solo the boat stops um so the more you're not rowing the more the boat is not moving even though it is moving but obviously not at the same rate as it would if you've got four people in but it really depends so there's someone there's some people who sit, still say stick to the two 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 some people that like to have a longer sleep and then little tiny sleeps around that then there's some people who've done two medium sleeps and there's and i don't know whether so for me i'm not a big one on routine um so i was thinking about this the other night i was like do i set myself and get into a routine which everyone says is so important or do I just go by knowing that I have to that I have to do my best and achieve and go beyond what I would like so do I do an eight hours on two hours off three hours on three hours off eight hours on whatever it you know there's so many different combinations you can make up for a 24 hour um thing or do I just go right today I'm going to do it this way and then next week I'm going to do it that way and the week after I'm going to do it that way because then I've almost broken it down 
into li into little mini adventures because I've got a different way of doing it. And then it's all depends on the weather as well. Like if the weather's amazing, I can sleep. If the weather's not, I've got a row. I don't know. Being a mathematician, I quite like the idea of coming up with how many different combinations of eat, sleep, row, repeat patterns I can <laughs> I can create within my forty five days. <laughs> I love that term, the little mini adventures. That was, yeah. uh, and being able to break it up, I, I was having the same kind of thought. So having you walk through that process of, does it make more sense to do the routine or to, to kind of mix it up? I think that that's a really valid question. I was kind of having the same discussion in my head and I don't, I'm not sure what I would settle on, I think, but just having the self-awareness that, you know, recognizing that maybe the routine isn't something that, um, naturally you lean in towards um i think is is a really big first step like in it in trying to figure out what that is and i think that um it will be so dependent and, and like you said it, having that ability to adapt and to be flexible is kind of one of the hallmarks of that associative kind of thought um so i'm interested to see what you end up doing <laughs> yeah me too that's why i love doing these things it's so like the unknown to me is just so exciting i'm like i just want to know how it turns out and what did work and what didn't work and Mm -hmm. like learning learning on the job and um, yeah. flexibility. like I'm I believe that because of just the life I've led and the way I lead it and I've moved house left right center and I think I'm very flexible and I think that's going to be something that's that lends in my favor so the mm -hmm. fact that oh it hasn't worked out today well okay well it doesn't matter whereas I know for certain that you know people that need to know exactly where it is what's happening when and how to do it and they need to have that all planned out and ready whereas I'm actually more the solver and I will go with it as it as it happens I mm -hmm. think so kind of jump in the middle a little bit and then yeah. figure it out and I think that there's also a really strong um current that I'm getting obviously underneath it's the knowing yourself right so having that self-awareness but then um just the confidence um in yourself I can definitely hear that coming through and the confidence in your ability um to use your strengths and to use um your mind and to use your energy in a way that is going to solve the problem, right? That is going to move you forward. So, and, and do you think that that confidence, um, you've talked about the tie to the purpose and the tie to the, the relationships, is that confidence something that's built in you over time that has really grown or um, just through your experiences or is that something that you've kind of always had? It's really, it's amazing. I've had an incredible upbringing thanks to my parents who have just let me be, in, they've always encouraged us, four of us, and they've always encouraged us to be independent and be different from one another and all that sort of stuff and they've let us fail and never told us off when that has happened and you know <laughs> all those great things that you that you that you kind of let you that most lots of people don't let their child do but in fact my, mm -hmm. our parents did and as a result we respected them so we didn't cause too much pain <laughs> uh, I don't know my mum as well she might not say the same um so that that's a lot of confidence came from that in the in the first place um but so yeah I mean Two years ago, which is very interesting, I would have said I was very confident, but I met the guy who's got the boat, Charlie, and the rowing, and when they said, oh, you should do it, and I was like, no, you're all right, thanks. I would, there's no way I'd want to go out in the Atlantic on my own, um, and I'm no way I'm going in a, a four-man boat, because I've done a sick, I did a journey from UK to Cape Town with six people, so we were very enclosed in our own little group, and I felt like I'd done my sort of team, <laughs> my teamwork for, for, for a long time. <laughs> So I was like, I know the dynamics of teams. So I'm not going to do a team and there's no way I do solo. And then two years later, without, with no thought whatsoever, when mum says to me, I think Prince Harry would make a great boyfriend. And I'm like, great. How am I going to get his attention? I know what, I'll row the Atlantic. There was no thought Perfect. between them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all Prince Harry, really. Um, <laughs> ah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, blame it on the one. The truth comes <laughs> out, yeah. Um, you have to fight <laughs> Meghan Markle about it, but... I know, never mind. Never too late. Um, but so what has happened between those two years that makes me say, oh, no, there's no way I'd do that solo. That's crazy. To just being like, yeah, I'll row the Atlantic. Well... There's two things. One is I had been a little bit single for a little bit more. Um, and I think I developed and grown a little bit. I'm then 36, so I'm pretty f fully grown right now. But um, I set up a charity and I set up a, set up a business. I realized that I was capable of those sorts of things, even though I didn't have a business background or really a charity background. So I didn't have, like, I didn't know how to do any of this. But I realized that if you work with people, how much can be done and actually 
the, you know, there were those little things that didn't work out and you'd go around a different direction. And ultimately you're trying to get from A to B, but actually it, was, it wasn't a straight line. It was a, the ziggy zaggiest type of line, but I still got to B. And actually along the way, I'd learned so many different things that I believe were really important and obviously made me confident enough to go, you know, I wrote Atlantic. I also think that that little pituitary tumor that came back. So the first one was in 2009. We then discovered another one in June this year. So that was after I had decided to row the Atlantic. I have a little wonder whether it was making me a little bit high on life um, <laughs> and whether it did kind of put, put ideas into my head that were great when they might not have been great. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting, the confidence, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Kiko, you know what's amazing? I, I keep thinking about this. <clears throat> so Kiko, to give you some perspective here, we. We've done uh, uh, some teaching and lecturing on, on these cognitive preferences with um, some members of uh, the U.S. Special Forces down at, uh, ta in Tampa at JSOU, which is their uh, Joint Special Operations University. So, so just to give you some perspective, your, your scoring is higher on the associative side. And Cam, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want your help on this. I'll, I'm going to pull up the, uh, the share screen for Kiko scoring so anybody watching or, or viewing at home can take a look at it. Um, but Kiko, again, going back to what I was saying, is that you, your, your scores are very similar to what we see at Special Forces. And, and these, are, these are individuals who, who live in the gray area. Um, you know, every day is a different day. They're, they're doing incredibly uh, intensive missions. They're very resilient. You know, they, they understand that there may be some challenges one day, but the next day they wake up and, and here we go again. And let's find a way to make things happen. And so... Yeah. We've talked a lot about your, your CPP scoring, um, again, what we call cognitive preferences. Um, I haven't seen, I, we have a teammate who's close to yours on, on the 89 associative, um, 11 sequential. Your listener is balanced. Um, it, that, that, again, that's, that is about the average we see at Special Forces. Mover is, mover is higher. You're a little bit higher on the mover side. Higher observer, very consistent with that. Reader's a little bit lower, but that's simply decoding text. And, and when we say, you know, you're, you're a, a little bit of a, a, you know, a lower on the reader side, it's that you're not a bad reader. You know, you read what you want to read if it's important to you. And then we relate that back maybe to the context um, of why that might be important. Then you can read for as long as you decide you want to read. If it's not important to you, sometimes the text just doesn't resonate and you have to find some other strategies. But then you're also a little bit higher on the talker side as well. Um, and you can see there's this other uh, graph here. Um, but Cam, why don't you jump in a little bit? Because I know that you know the, a lot of your clients, and uh, you, you mentioned are higher associates, and I keep hearing Kiko's language, which is this resilience. And, you know, if it doesn't work, I'm going to try it a different way. That's, that is very, very, very much you know, uh, um, relative to what high, how high associates process things and how they, move, you know, how they move through life in a lot of cases. Right. And um, I think the uh, what I'm, what's getting my attention is the the observer and the associative together. Right. And uh, Kiko, you, you're talking about I, I love the term Kikonomics before. Yeah. And as you were describing, as you were uh, filling in sort of your approach to how you might tackle the 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 daily challenge of getting 660. Uh, uh, miles or uh, I'm not sure if it was miles or, or kilometers, but that, that number. Um, yeah, it was uh, it, this, this, what, what, uh, what came in my mind was this uh, notion of Kiko physics. Yeah. Right. Is this sort of, okay, I'm going to take it as it comes. I'm going to adjust as I go. And I think that that's what we've seen with our special forces uh, individuals, right? They have the mission they have a sense of this is what we need to do, but they're improvising and adjusting, right? That flexibility and that ability to sort of use that high observer, pay attention to, uh, and as, as Aaron said, it's, um, this is, there are a lot of people out there with high observer, or high associative who are not aware. They're not in touch. And you are very much, Right. You, as you're talking, it's sort of paying attention to uh, your surroundings, your environment, but also uh, how you're doing, right? Um, and, and basically uh, doing what you need to do 
in that moment, whether it's sleep or row, uh, rest, eat, etc. Yeah, I think um, yeah, you're right, and it's really interesting. But if you spoke to me two years ago, you probably wouldn't have said this at all because because I've had to give talks to people like um, you know in this journey in this last year I've been talking to UBS and Santander like massive corporate banks with people who know what they're talking about so I've had to kind of just over the time and people keep asking me these questions and I, I've I've literally formulated this in the last year and but saying that I've always believed or I've always thought that as soon as you know that you're good at something or as soon as you know that you've got a weakness that's when you can actually when you become aware of it then you can work on it in whether you know so for me if I if I know that I'm good at talking and I can smile at people and I can give them energy then I'm that's the first thing I do because I know I'm good at it if I know I'm not so good at being um tactful then which <laughs> I'm not then I'm very willing and happy and understanding that oh I might have said something that was wrong um in that process so but it's only been in this last year that I've really realized that things like controlling situations so they are talking about how we need to move and change and adapt life does not follow a path never as, as much as we'd want it to there's too many things there's environment there's people there's all sorts of things that are going to make our plan not work out and as soon as you can realize that and you can go oh well i'm going to get there i'm just going to have to understand and it might not be the way that i want it to be then i think it becomes easier for us to overcome those little blips that happen along the way. So you know you're gonna get there and it's not gonna be the way that we originally wanted it to. We want it to be the easiest way to get there. It's not gonna happen, probably 90% of the time. Um, and therefore you have to adapt to change because people and things and everything in life changes. And once you know that, once you're aware of that, it makes life a lot easier. It makes life a lot easier if you can be aware of the fact that you're worrying. If you are worrying about something and you can go, oh, I'm worrying about that. Do I need to be worrying about it? Is it going to help situation? This is what I believe is like the mental health, um, mental health training basically for, for people is to, the, yes, the awareness I think is just so important. Um, and yeah, I, I think anyone can become aware. It's just giving yourself time to, to really recognize what you're good at and what life is about and all those sorts of things. Uh, having, a, having an eight till six job doesn't help, to be honest people i don't have an eight to six job that's why I'm about redundancy right <clears throat> yeah. uh, same thing every day or <laughs> yeah yeah and, and not if you, it takes time if you're in a very comfortable job which is going forwards and you get your pay at the end of the month and then at the next month and you know when you pay your bills and life is is the same every single day then i don't think you are going to become that aware because you've got no reason to become aware because everything is just laid out for you in the way that you want that you know it's just it's there um, you don't need to be so aware, but when you do things <laughs> like me and chop and change and move here and do that and one across the Atlantic, suddenly you had to become aware in order to survive, in order to become resilient, it's the wrong way around, to become resilient to survive. Um, because if you're not, it's not going to work. Um, you know, that, that, lifestyle that lifestyle won't happen. Um, well, it's also it's a refreshing um, perspective that is so needed in our world right now with, uh, you know, on your side, you've had Brexit. On our side, we have our populism and um, this sort of uh, retreating from our problems and uh, us versus them. And, um, you know, it's just he here's the he this is the situation. This is the problem. And, um, you know, that I like just how you're approaching things in the sense of, uh, well, it's, it's figure out what the challenge is. Assemble a team. Right. That's going to support. Um, really accentuate the positives and watch out for those, those challenge areas um, and adjust as you go. But with, with uh, this idea of, you know, okay, we can do this because that's what I'm so impressed with is um, I think Aaron was speaking to your, your amount of confidence. Um, this can do um, this, yeah. th this, like we, we can do this, this is going to happen. Um, and so there's this positivity there that is just so refreshing and I, I do think you'll get Harry's attention. I'm absolutely confident of it. <laughs> it's called find a way or make a way, right? <laughs> Figure it out. I would love him. I would love him to be the, the family to be talking about it at Christmas over Christmas roast turkey. But you know, <laughs> oh, what about that? Going the Atlantic to get your attention. That'd be brilliant. <laughs>
<laughs> well, listen, hey, I've got I've got a question here that that, that I want to ask you because I, well, I was again I was watching some of your videos and then and then I also want to talk um, a little bit here because we have a little bit of time left. But um, you, you mentioned some of the female executives that you've been working with and, and speaking to, and I, I know that that's a, a large part of your thinking behind this is is about empowerment. Um, but let me ask you a direct question. So I'm watching your video. And you, you're, you're, and you, and you've, you got to, you guys have to go to, go to Kiko's uh, website because she's got a whole bunch of videos there, and she's done a lot of stuff with um, drones and, you know, very, very cool. Whoever produced those is, it did a good job on that. But you guys got into a sideways conversation here about uh, cleaning the underside of the boat. Yeah. Sharks. So, so, so Ooh. of course now I'm, my associative thinking. <laughs> Cam just, he just blanched. <laughs> that sailboat was sinking behind you. What? <laughs> we so, got to clean so, the bottom of the boat? <laughs> yeah, so, so let me yeah. just figure this out. So, so it's, whatever the time frame is, you've got every six days, now you got to clean the bottom of the boat. You're in the middle what? of the Atlantic, you've got a wetsuit, and you have a scraper? And, yeah, and, I, I, and I, what I don't is have that? A I don't have a wetsuit. I've got, I'll have my bikini. <laughs> or nothing and um my uh, my little scraper it's to take the barnacles off so that you don't right. drag and then obviously with barnacles you create little fishes and with little fishes you create bigger fishes and then you have a zoo with you which is very lovely to have you know a little moving zoo as you move into Barbados but it doesn't help for speed um and yeah I will literally have to jump into the water and scrape the bottom of the boat and, and then and, about what what again five six days you got you have to do it all that or i think it's once every 10 days which is interesting because i don't know i, I know i've got anti there's anti like stuff on the boat but um and if i go quick enough then i guess i only have to do it twice rather than <laughs> <laughs> there's an incentive there's an incentive there right. there's so many incentives to doing it quickly i can tell you um uh yeah so and you know everyone says what about the sharks and I think you, you hear about people who say, oh, I think we saw, I think we saw a shark or we saw a, something, you know, riding one of the waves. But it's a big old ocean out there. And like, what are the chances of him with his big chompy teeth being right underneath me while I just happen to be cleaning the bottom of my boat? I mean, it's just so far in a million. I could just, <laughs> I say that now, I've got to come back with half a leg, aren't I? <laughs> well, in, in, um, in the video, and see, this is what, what I found funny. And uh, well, let me back up. So, so you said you rode from, from England to Cape Town. Did you guys see any sharks then? No, no, sorry, we, we drove, drove, oh, you drove. drove. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. I thought, I, thought, I was like, I thought I, there was a, other information, but. That would be, so, that would be insane. <laughs> but, you know, I, I guess going back to this and everything, it's just like, you know, you, you're, you, you know, you know, you have to do this. I mean, you can't not do this. And, you know, so, yeah. so I guess you stay, I just get this image, you know, it's like, I've seen Jaws how many times, you know, <laughs> what are you gonna do? You're gonna yeah. lean in, you're gonna look around. <laughs> This is it, isn't it? There's always the what if. There are those people who li you live by. There's so many people like, what if, what if, what? I'm like, well, what if, what if, what if? It's an if, isn't it? So you kind of weigh up the percentage of the if it happens, which generally is very small in most of those right. cases when people say what Probably. if. And yeah, and then you look at yourself and you look at your resources and you can lower your what if probabilities by the fact that you've got strength and you've got a good boat and you've got intelligence and you've got a team of people supporting you and that other people have done it and they're not and you kind of suddenly go well actually no one's ever had their leg bitten off by a shark across the atlantic in an ocean rowing boat that what if it's pretty low you know and <laughs> what if that happens well let's just get on with life and stop worrying about the what ifs otherwise i could just sit in my box all day and do nothing and it's not really a life is it right so i want to jump in because Perry's a high observer, and I think that for him, the shark represents uh, vulnerability, the ultimate vulnerability and fear. And so, like, yeah, just as you, as he, I didn't see that part of the video of this sort of climbing out of your boat. No, I made you know, that up. I was, I, just, I was just projecting that. I'm going, well, this is how it has to happen. And I'm going, well, what's the process behind that? See, that's my dual processor going. I'm like, have you thought that through? Is there a process? Or are you literally going to jump in the water with that, that little scraper and just start you know, chipping barnacles. So that's what I wanted to find out. Um, yeah, who's, you go for it. <laughs> no, that's, I, I'm not scraping barnacles. Is that, is that it? Is that the process, Kiko? Yeah, I think, well, so firstly, I'm like, other people have done it, so why can't I do it? That's, that's a lot of my attitude towards most things. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I have 
to, I mean, I don't have to have to have to do it, but it's just going to make me go a bit faster. I don't know what happens if you don't do it. It's not like I'm not going to get across. Right. Um, the drag factor just becomes, you just got to row a bit harder to get the same amount of distance. And when you're hurting, I guess it's probably easier to get in the water and scrape the barnacles than it is to feel more pain in your muscles. So I guess, you know, it's one of those things, what do you choose? Um, to me, to get in the boat, to get under and scrape for the, very tiny possibility that there might be a shark around is nicer than the idea of having to row harder. Yeah, so I want to jump it'd in. I think it like a nice refresher, actually, <laughs> kind of wake you up a little bit. You just do it when you need to, to kind of shift gears, when you need your little change up, jump in the water, a little wake up, scrape a little, get back on and row again. That's right, so the adventure for the day. I want to, yeah. so we want to go over to the, the female empowerment uh, in, in a moment, but I want to just Paul, I guess I'm curious about, we, we talked earlier about uh, sort of, um, you know, areas where you crush and areas where there might be a challenge. And um, for me, getting out of the boat and in the water would be the challenge. Not so much about sharks, but just the unknown. And, and, I, and I, I'm just, you know, I, just, I had a visceral response when I heard Perry say that. But my yeah. question to you is, like, what do you see, what do you see to be your greatest challenge? Um, you know, in this endeavor, Kiko, like as you look at this, so getting out of the boat and scraping is not going to be the challenge. What, what do you see as your greatest, uh, the thing that you're going to have to face and overcome in, in this uh, big endeavor? Well, I keep going. I think it's going to be, you know, that is ultimately, it's going to be, it's going to hurt. Like, you know, it's going to hurt. There's not going to be anyone around that. And there's all those little, little bits and pieces which add to, keep me going and there's little bits and pieces which are going to go and try and stop me from doing it. You know, every time something breaks or every time there's going to be all those little things, but ultimately the physical and the mental side of it, the fact that there's no one else there and I'm not going to have human contact. I've never done that before. Um, so, but I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, it's, I think it's really interesting. It's almost like I'm doing my own science experiment <laughs> on myself um, to, uh, and I think that awareness that you we were talking about earlier is really important because I think that will help having that awareness and being able to see my behavior. If I can, if I can be aware of what my behavior is, then I, you're more likely to be able to overcome it and, and, you know, change the path that the, the negative path that you could potentially be on. Um, physically, I just, I want to see, I just, when I step off the boat, A, I want to know if I'm going to cry. Cause that would be quite interesting. of like that um, an immense kind of emotional completion. I'm sure I will cry. I kind of half cry when I think about it now and I haven't even done it yet. <laughs> um, and then, like, what my body's going to physically look like, I think, is going to be a bit of a challenge. I've been trying to put on weight, and I'm struggling. Um, so I'm going to have to eat a lot. Eating is going to be a challenge. Eating 6,000 calories a day in order to not get skinny and to have that energy is going to be a mega challenge. Well, I think, Kiko, I think I read uh, one of the other young ladies, a, a woman named Katie Spots, she said she just brought, like, 300 chocolate bars and just ate you should just say, you know, candy bars the whole time, which uh, yeah, I get that. I mean, I have yeah. friends who are endurance cyclists and they said, you know, the first endurance cyclist race they did over in Iceland, they, they tried to pack everything from, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, beef jerky and biltong and all this good, you know, stuff that would actually, they, they thought was right. And they said in the end of it, they were just eating uh, Snickers bars. That, that was what they existed on. They said that was fine. We just burned them off. So. Yeah, I, there is that, isn't it? I've been, to be honest, I, I'm a science. I'm a sciencey person. I'm a doctor's daughter, so I, I'm kind of quite up on, without having training or knowing, but I understand how the body works and it's like what you put in is what you get out. Um, so I have got. I've tried to steer away from things like chocolate bars. So I've got amazing nutrition that I've picked myself. I've got <laughs> 100 mils of coconut oil. I got a down a day, so that's 900 calories done, right. nice and easy. Um, and then I've got you know healthy, vegans of fruit, cacao date chia seed all that sort of stuff you know it's all out there now it's all that amazing kind of thing and i'm just thinking it's hard enough as it is i want to at least make the nutrition as good as it can be you know make it as pure and clean i'd say that my nutrition is pretty clean i could I, i've got dried built on i've got a whole load of nuts i've got this high protein porridgey granola with some dried fruit i've got dried fruit i've got a tiny bit of chocolate every day i've got a tiny little bag of sweeties which are my like treats um and then all these like special bars that are made from good stuff and and, and homemade freeze-dried food so i think it's just really important to get 
like you say, what goes in comes out. So if you put in good, I'm hoping that good comes out. I'm just trying to keep it as, trying to lower as many of those bad things that could potentially come in. So chocolate, but I'm not a big chocolate fan either, to be honest. All right. Yeah. Anyway, that was a long answer. <laughs> well, that works. Well, let, let's talk, let's talk. <laughs> we, are, we are kind of on the downside. Um, and we really appreciate you taking time to, to meet with us today. This has been wonderful. But um, what I also want, I, I don't want to skip over this because I, I want to talk about the empowerment uh, uh, theme that we had discussed before. And can you tell me how that works into your thinking and, and, uh, and, and where that came from as far as this journey goes? Yeah, I guess. And some of um, the people you're connecting with as well. I mean, yeah, so I've connected with all women of all ages, all backgrounds from you know, I mean, when I say connected, I'm talking so specifically the ones who have supported with supported me with money in order to help me get to the start line, and then across the Atlantic, the ones who I'm connected to. Um, you know, from women who live in caravan parks to women who are sort of high net worth women in the city, and I met them in the toilet and told them what I was doing. They were like, "Here's a grand," you know. So, and you know, groups of school school girls who are rowing to raise the money, and it's a real variety. And I think where the whole woman woman thing came from is it's funny because I had in my paddleboard company I kept having these girls and ladies of sort of my age um, saying oh it's so great how you do that and you just got the balls to go and do it and you just do it I wish I could be like you I wish I could do it I'd be like you can do it what, what's stopping you and I've actually had quite a few of my mates who have literally just you know upped and left and done something different and it seemed that they've come to me and asked me about it and I went away and I thought I was like oh this is I should really be doing something about the fact that I've obviously got something as a woman that the other women who I'm talking to haven't got and and I think about what I'm like and if I can do something I'll do it whether it's a boy's job or a girl's job so to speak not that I believe um, and then I had another sort of light bulb moment when I don't define myself as a woman and I think that was really it was quite interesting. I define myself as Kiko and I can do some things and I can't do other things. Um, <laughs> I put, <laughs> I put some poor guy in a headlock on Friday night when I was out. Um, cause he was rude to me and that was quite funny. Um, <laughs> and you know, How did that end up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it I ended was. up in your favor, right? <laughs> yeah, ended up in my favor. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, um, I, uh, there's a, there's a little bit of, I just wish, I don't know if it's women empowerment. It's just I want women to understand that they are as capable to do what men can do as, you know, just because they are a woman, just because they've grown up, they've, they've grown up doing, having makeup and doing girly things and all that. And, you know, you follow the media and the media absolutely makes me go, Grr! like, why, why do we push all this stuff onto people? And that this is what you're supposed to do and buy in order to be happy. And it's like, Girls, women, ladies, look, check it out. We're just, we're all pretty much, you know, given the same things. We're given a body that moves, most of us, um, a brain that works. And it really is our choice. You don't have to follow what everyone's telling you, like women have to be like, and let's be strong. And I've got these tools like Keekonomics. I go to these talks, I tell the women about Keekonomics and they've all come to me and said, oh my God, I love it. I love that idea. It's actually something that we can all do you know, one woman somewhere high up in Santander went, oh, you're born resilient. And I went, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not born resilient. You, you earn this. You, your parents definitely help you become resilient and then take you to work to work to continue with that resilience. And, you know, whoever you are, I mean, it's really, I think men need to be as keekonomic as, as women do. I don't think, I think this whole like woman empowerment thing actually spans across the men as well. Um, but I think- Absolutely. Because, Yep. Because men have always been paid more than women. There's a, suddenly there's this thing about, you know, women empowerment. But actually, I think men's mental health is worse, if anything, than women's mental health. And it all, women's empowerment, I think, and mental health is linked. Um, it's, it's just about being yourself, really. It's kind of, I am a woman. I'm strong. I'm doing this. I'm not married. I haven't got kids. And I don't, you know, if, um, if Prince Harry decides that actually I'm a better option, then great. But at the moment, I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. Um, and anyway, you don't have to look in a certain way. You don't have to be behaving like the media tells you just ultimately just like be yourself. And I really hope that that's what, so in terms of women empowerment, I don't know, if, I've always sort of slightly struggled with the words of women empowerment. I was like, women be yourself kind of thing. Mm. 
because that I think is when you can become yourself and not worry about who you are and what you are and whether you're good at that or not good at that or whether you're doing a man's job or a woman's job or whatever it's just you are being who you are and that is what is the easiest and the best for everybody so let's all just be like that is what I would say really I just happen to be a woman who's <laughs> who's who's doing something you know not so womanly <laughs> You know, hey, Aaron, you know, you know what um, Kiko's reminding me of when we did uh, did our one of our original podcasts with you and you talked about how you coach people. And, and I think mm-hmm. we brought up that topic about, you know, what's the difference between coaching a man and coaching a woman? What? Yeah. Will you, yeah. Expand on that, will you? Well, it's funny because I very much ascribe Kiko to really everything that you're saying. I I've never really seen um there be these huge differences uh just based totally on gender i think of people as people and so when i'm coaching i'm coaching the individual um to be their best self i'm not coaching a girl athlete or a female athlete or a male athlete i'm coaching a person um and whether i'm coaching a a group of people that all happen to be female um each one of them has different experiences different strengths different um, are at different stages of their developmental journey, their confidence journey, um, their just leadership journey, wherever they are. And um, I think that, uh, I think we were talking about this, Perry, a little bit in the context of maybe kind of having um, the dual processing, like being able to adapt to whatever situation right. um, and kind of also the crossover. Um, I think that this was a side conversation, but with Strengths Quest as well, the Strengths Finder analysis. Um, one of my strengths is individualization. So I think that that um, also ties in. So that's kind of this idea that um, you're really looking at the unique aspects of each individual situation or person and how do you kind of work with them. But I've also struggled a lot with the term like a female empowerment um, or just the the female, you know, women's movement kind of stuff. Um, it always feels a little... <sighs> I don't want to make it sound like it's a a bad thing by any means, but I think that we can empower everybody. Um, And I also don't need somebody. It always makes me feel like I have to give people, people have to give me a leg up. And I think that I have the, um, I appreciate the confidence in Kiko's voice and in her mission and journey, because you can, you can have that confidence in yourself. I can empower myself. Um, And I think that with coaching it's kind of breaking down some of these gender stereotypes um, and saying, no, like guys, you can do this girls, you can do this. It doesn't matter. You're a person. We can all do whatever it is that we want. Um, So yeah, I, I, it's funny. I, you don't often hear that though resonated from other people. So I appreciate very much your perspective, Kiko. There's a, there's also a, there's a, so a generational element here too, Aaron, the fact you're our uh, representative millennial and not to, <laughs> yeah. you know, not to bring in another, you know, uh, an artificial construct, right. Of, if you're, mm-hmm. again, but um, in, in working with you and Chris and just, you know, that, that younger generations will often it's, it's, they don't necessarily see uh, they don't see gender. Right? They don't. They don't see color. Right? It's just you. People are who they are, and that's that. And and um, again, this positive form of leadership is really this disruptive you know, element here of disrupting these sort of uh, old rules, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever these social constructs are of men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to do that, or and just like uh, Kiko, I love that. This is women be yourselves. Um, yeah, I think everyone be yourself. Like I was just thinking in the leadership kind of context. Firstly, I just want to say I sometimes think that this whole female empowerment thing is that we're not doing ourselves any favors. It's a bit like the Jesus lover who stands on the corner and tells everyone, like you know, forces you to think that it's all about Jesus. And so it's the same. And the environmentalist who's like, you know, like has it. It's just like I think we just need to actually calm down a little bit and focus, like we say, <laughs> on the on the person if you're standing as a leader in a room and you're talking to people if you know there are women in there who are like oh women empowerment look i'm a woman and check me out it's like i'm actually going to steer away from that it's like you're doing a (laughs) negative service to yourself just be be who you are like whatever you are whether you're male whether you're woman whether you're not sure whatever if you are yourself your qualities are going to shine through and whoever is leading um 
it's going to be wanting to work with you no matter who, what, where, colour, you know. And I always think that anyone who gets on their high horse about anything, it's just like, just doesn't do anyone any favours. <laughs> um, yeah. I think the, the high, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, you, you say. I was I was just also thinking too like I think there's the high horse piece of it but then I think that so much of what we started talking about and so much of having the CPP as a tool is about building awareness as well um, and so I think that there's the high horse aspect and then there's also the awareness to recognize like yes there are differences but there are differences between everyone you know so the idea of not seeing gender or not seeing color um, might be a, a little bit maybe that's too big of a sweep, you know, like uh, acknowledging kind of where people have come from and the challenges that they've faced, or if there are systemic things kind of in place that have, uh, like you, you mentioned before, um, the reality of the fact that men have historically been paid more than women and still are, you know, dollar for dollar in a lot of situations, um, or I guess euros for pounds for pounds. Um, yeah. We're going international now. Um, but so there are some, there are some realities, uh, you know, that stereotypes I think a lot of times are founded in a reality um, and so it's just kind of pulling that out and kind of finding this balanced middle ground um, where we're really serving the needs of everyone and where we're like you said just helping people be their best self and whatever that looks like for that person. Um, yeah. Well <clears throat> you know Aaron um, Kiko just a little bit about Avalon and I think I think the the notion that we always founded our, our this company on was the notion of roundtable leadership, and so um, you know it, it, it's not necessarily the the, the most efficient, um, but you know again you're supporting people's best assets, and and drawing it back to the reason that we love this particular survey, um, very specifically when we first started uh, doing work with this particular tool, um, and you know this is Aaron is at my alma mater at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. So I went up and, and worked with a number of the student athletes up there, handpicked leaders. Aaron was one of those uh, leaders. And, and the thing that I took away from that was, was that the, uh, if male, female, it didn't matter. The, the, the individuals we worked with, um, you know, who, who were students and graduate students, they immediately said, our coaches need to take this. Because, because it, and that was a huge, huge epiphany for me because I said, my gosh, I go back, you know, in, in the older days. I mean, I, and I coached, you know, it was top-down leadership. You never even talked to the head coach. You didn't have a conversation with the head coach. He told you what to do. And, and that, was, that was how it was all placed out. Well, this is very, very different. You know, and people, you know, we're connecting and, and we connected through, uh, you know, a couple of different people. And the next thing you know, we're having a transatlantic conversation, you know, hopefully, you know, helping you. And let's get the word out about your mission and what you're trying to do here. Uh, because it's not just about rowing across the Atlantic. It's about saying that, that you know, let's find a common purpose. Let's get the right people, you know, assemble the right team. And, and you can do, you, 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 can, you can build mountains. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty amazing you know, to, to think that way. And, and I think, you know, I, I've always been a bit of a, you know, on, on a ramble myself, but, you know, a bit of an Anglophile. And I have very tight uh, uh, ties over to the UK and I have family members in the UK. And, and I, you know, I think, I think in a, a lot of cases, um, you know, questions of, of uh, equality, of empowerment, uh, uh, different business models, how people are connecting across platforms. Uh, if we if we decide that we want to do this, we'll do it. And and you know, you, you, obviously the UK is going through some you know the struggles with Brexit, and we have our own issues here at home. And this is not about politics for us, uh, but but it's about the model. And if the model is flexible, and and we find these points of connection, like I said, I think I think that's when you have real impact. Um, yeah. So, listen, I know we have to wind down, Cam. I know you have a hard stop here. Uh, let's give Kiko some plugs. Um, Kiko, I'm going to read this off of your website right now. You correct me if I'm wrong. So, I want everybody to go to kikomatthews.co.uk. And if you want to look at her website, it's k-i-k-o matthews.co.uk. She's got a lot of good videos. She's got updates, the whole story. Um, if you'd like to be a sponsor, we'd, we'd love to get her some more sponsors. Um, Avalon's going to throw a few bucks her way because uh, we believe in it and we believe in what you're doing. Thank you. Anything else you want to plug? That, that's, the, that's the beauty of this platform. Anything else you want to talk about? Anything you need to plug here or tell people to go to other, I know you have maybe another uh, website, I think, where they can donate or to also donate to the hospital as well. Um, yeah, so on the website, there's all the donation things. Um, I've got all my 
luckily I'm the only Kiko Matthews in the world. So um, if you Google me, <laughs> I pretty much my Facebook, my Instagram, Twitter is all Kiko Matthews. Um, website, yeah, has pretty much all of that on it anyway. And if there is anyone out there who wants to brand brand the boat or me, that, that is still available because I'm very fortunate. I've got this amazing team of women who have got me to the start line. So yeah, that is it. And I'm hoping, I seem to be drawn to the US of A. So maybe I'll um, have an appearance one day in, in America. Who knows? Maybe sooner rather than later. I think we'll, uh, we'll try and yeah. figure something out here in Washington and get you over to the embassy or, uh, or the consulate and do some stuff over here if you'd be up for it. So, but keep us posted on what you're up to. Yeah, um, amazing. And, you know, once again, Cam, thank you very much. Aaron, thank you very much. And again, Kiko, thank you for your time today. Um, I know it's a little bit later in the afternoon for you, the early evening. Um, but if people would like to see what we're talking about here, uh, please go to www.avalonleadership.com. You can take the particular assessment called the CPP. Uh, all you have to do is join Avalon. That's free. Um, and then for you know, a few extra dollars, you can go ahead and take the, the, uh, the assessment and kind of find out where you stand as far as your cognitive preferences. Cam, you got the last word. What else? As we sign off. Uh, I've just, I've just uh, really enjoyed uh, speaking with Kiko and uh, learning about uh, this adventure and then also just your unique perspective. Um, the, just the, the confidence and the, uh, the, the systems and the, the way that you've um, found your way through the world. I love the, um, the term of key economics and, and uh, just how you being in touch with your wiring and uh, your natural assets, you're just leaning way into those and making amazing things happen. And um, also the, just the, uh, how you're inspiring others, be, be them uh, women, men, uh, anyone. It's just, uh, just really a lot of fun to be a part of that today. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Kiko. And, and actually, Aaron, you get the last, last word. Oh, the last, last word. I don't know. The last, I'm, last word. I'm, so I'm qualified for this. Uh, I just want to say, I've really appreciated the conversation in general and really excited to kind of continue following you on your journey and um, hope that you do one day make it to the U.S. and uh, get a chance to meet you in, in person and actually see your face since I'm not on video right now, so I'm missing out on that opportunity as well. But uh, but best of luck to you and let us know um, how we can continue to be supportive um, as you take on this, this kind of epic journey. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you guys so much as well for, for all of the, those lovely words and having me on your show, on your podcast. So thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Kiko, and best of luck here in your journey. I know you're leaving on the 31st of, uh, of January, so it's coming up. So good luck to you, and thanks yeah. again. All right. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com, where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us. And please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.